The most successful coaches never stop learning. They are committed to their personal growth and making themselves better. I'm Colby Donovan, and welcome to the Coaching Coaches Podcast. I'll speak with the world's most respected coaches, best-selling authors, and top business leaders to give you insight into their philosophies, lessons, and mindsets for you to apply to your own life. Head on over to coachingcoaches.co where you can subscribe to this podcast and join some of the top coaches around the country who also enjoy our regular newsletter. I have an extra special guest for you today. It's Anson Dorrance, UNC women's soccer head coach who's won 22 national championships and is the first coach in NCAA history to win 20 championships coaching in a single sport. And as impressive as that is, his approach to coaching, competitiveness, and character development of his girls is even more impressive. In this episode, we discuss why he doesn't think you can teach leadership, why he thinks it's so important to take personal ownership of your own outcome and learn to handle adversity, and how he's evolved as a coach over the years. He also talks about his relationship with coaches outside of women's soccer and what he's learned from them with coaches like Dean Smith and Pete Carroll. Please enjoy the episode. Coach, thanks for joining me today. My pleasure. So I want to get right into something I heard you say that I was very surprised by, and I bet you get this a lot, but talk to me about leadership, what you think about it, and can it be taught? Yeah, I'm uh, not one of these people that uh, is convinced that uh, you can teach leadership. Um, Even though I try to do it every single year, I guess what I've learned in my experience is you can give people leadership opportunities and obviously they can jump on it or not, but you can't have any sort of constructed uh, effort to teach them to be leaders. And trust me, I try every single spring to do that. And I'm still trying. I mean, you know, we'll do some all kinds of stuff. And um, I've got a leadership council. Um, I picked up something from uh, Urban Meyer, who was the UF football coach, I guess, for a while. He does this thing that he calls a leadership council. And I really like the idea. So what this is is everyone has an opportunity to end up in a leadership position with his system. And I really like that idea. So I stole it. Uh, We've been using it uh, and I do like it. And so under his philosophy, I assume this is what it was, or maybe I've uh, taken it and changed it. But basically uh, all of his seniors are on the leadership council. And then he picks one junior, one sophomore, one freshman, or maybe he has more than one because the football team is so huge. Uh, So I took the idea, uh, and so that's what we've got. Our leadership council are all the seniors in the program, but it actually begins in the spring of a kid's junior year because that's the uh, semester where we're preparing for the following fall, and that's when I'm training my my leaders. So on our leadership council, um, we do all these different things uh, to try to uh, get them to be uh, leaders. And what's fascinating to me is – I have hypocritically spoken at more leadership conferences uh, with this great fear that someone out there is going to ask me if it's possible to teach leadership. And here are these people sitting in front of me that have paid anywhere from 25 bucks to, you know, 5,000 to listen to me speak on leadership. And I'm just warning them. If one guy in the audience says, do you think you can teach leadership? I'm going to say no. Um, and even though I am going to cash check you've given me to speak on leadership, I just don't think you can do it. Uh, so please be warned that if anyone out there says, you know, Anson, do you think you can actually teach leadership? I can, I'm going to say, no, I don't think you can. I think some people develop into leaders. I think people that are given opportunities to lead can jump on it and run with it. Uh, and so, uh, I'm just warning everyone in advance. I just don't believe you can. Why don't I believe you can? Cause I've been trying to do this for 43 years. And yeah, we've had some great leaders, but I don't think I've taught them anything. All I've done is given them an opportunity to lead and that's it. And then all of a sudden I've watched them run with it. Uh, So uh, we can certainly drill into this if you like, but I just, uh, I just don't think you can. I don't think you can teach it. Do you think 
So I hear you say you've given them the opportunity to lead. So, you, you know, you, you've got some involvement in the process. Do you think that they would agree that you did not teach them anything about leadership and came into their own? If they were speaking honestly without feeling pressured <laughs> to say yes? Well, the problem with whenever you ask someone that question, uh, they know that they have an opportunity to pay a tribute to you. Yes. So what they will say is, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He really taught me a lot about leadership, but I just think it's a crock. I think what they're doing is they're responding to the interviewer. And a lot of these kids I've coached, I, I love these kids and my relationship with them is really good. And so they know how they're going to set up the answer. They're going to set up the answer to, in a way, praise their relationship with me. And they will attribute all these different things to me that I just don't qualify for only because they're, you know, wonderful human beings. Uh, and as they've heard me say over the years about how extraordinary they were and all these different areas, they're going to do the same for me. So um, I don't think you're going to get an honest answer out of someone that uh, likes me and cares for me when you ask them if I've taught them anything about leadership, because we, I certainly try. Yeah. Uh, and maybe they're going to attribute my efforts to having taught them something but I just don't think that's the case. Um, and so of course I am, you know, undermining this whole industry of people that uh, are pretending that they're actually teaching people something about leadership. And now, you know, they're teaching tools and all this sort of stuff. And, you know, I could go ad nauseum about all the different, you know, things that they're pretending to teach you. Uh, but I'll tell you this, in my experience, uh, it just can't be taught. Now, what I'm always hoping for is that a leader will emerge. Uh, and some years they don't. Uh, and some years I am leading from the sideline. Um, and uh, we've got all these ways we qualify leadership. One of the ones that drives me most crazy is leading by example. Leading by example is another phrase for a great player. They're not leading by example. They just enjoy getting out there and kicking everyone's rear end in. Um, because that's what I love when I was playing sports at a high level. I just love going out there and, you know, just destroying people. Um, and that's what motivated me, that. Now, every now and again, you know, something would come out of my mouth that demonstrated uh, some occasional leadership qualities. But trust me, there are a lot of us that just like going out there and destroying people, competing, winning. Um, they're not leading by example. Uh, they might be recruiting people to help them win. Uh, and they might be recruiting them by, you know, working hard. But uh, uh, leading by example, I think, is also uh, an absolute uh, myth. And I think it's they're confusing it with a great player. And so I know you're huge on personal development and learning and reading books. And we'll talk about that later. I imagine you've read Mindset by Carol Dweck, a book that most coaches mm -hmm. have read, talk about, refer to. How do you think about this idea that leadership can't be taught with what she talks about in her book? Basically, effort is everything. Um, so for me, uh, that's, uh, that's what uh, Dweck uh, uh, taught me, is that basically so much uh, of your success comes down to uh, uh, this growth mindset. And a growth mindset is all about, you know, committing yourself to working hard. Um, and uh, I love that. I love uh, anyone that tries to take personal responsibility uh, for everything. So uh, Dweck uh, was so good about teaching us this in a very simple way, because I think uh, so many theories are so complex, uh, you can't really I guess, apply them to your own life, your own uh, coaching philosophy. But that's what's so good about Dweck, you can. Because what we see is we see people with personal narratives that protect themselves uh, from pain. Uh, and this personal narrative is also uh, protecting themselves from accountability. And the thing I love about Dweck's work is she shatters the myth about, um, about basically how you're, you're not accountable. Uh, she basically says you are accountable. Uh, and I think a lot of us that become effective coaches are very good at changing a person's personal narrative uh, from that to the truth. And the faster we can as coaches make someone's personal narrative the truth, the faster that player is going to become a more effective one. 
uh, because we're all uh, human. We all hate, you know, pain uh, and we all hate responsibility for failure. Uh, and yet the faster you can embrace your failures and say, you know what, I'm going to have to change. Uh, this wasn't good enough. That wasn't good enough. And I'm going to take full accountable. I'm going to be fully accountable for this. Uh, and I'm going to see if I can change uh, uh, this in my own life. And then obviously, if you're a team player, that changes the team around you as well. So I think uh, Dweck had huge value, well, has huge value for all of us that coach. When you talk about shielding yourself from pain, do you mean trying to prevent yourself from being fully, fully vulnerable and going for whatever it is in life you want to, risking that you could come up short? Well, what's happening now is the way uh, uh, our parents are raising us. Uh, basically, uh, uh, the helicopter parent has now evolved into the snowplow parent where this parent is pushing every obstacle out of the way for their children. And obviously uh, athletics has played a part in this. Uh, as you can see, you know, the, uh, the sailors at Stanford and the rowers at, I don't know what it was, you know, Southern California or whatever, uh, where the parents are buying their way into these great universities, even though their kids had no athletic talent. And so this is the, the extreme of the snowplow parent. I mean, they didn't have to qualify for the school they were admitted to. Uh, the parents bought their way in. And so this is where uh, parenthood is evolving. Uh, but the pre-stage before this uh, snowplow parent was the parent that wanted to make sure their kids did not suffer. And yet, I don't think there's a psychologist out there, and certainly not a sports psychologist out there, that will ever tell you that adversity is bad for you. It's not. It's basically conquering these failures and conquering the pain uh, and correcting it that's going to take you to the promised land. Uh, very few of us uh, grow through, you know, joy. Uh, we grow through adversity. We grow through suffering. Uh, we grow through trying to change this feeling uh, to challenge us to do even better. And so the parents that think they're really doing a great job protecting all of their kids from pain have no idea the damage they're doing. Uh, what we have to do as fast as possible is to make sure every person that we're responsible for uh, is taking responsibility for everything that happens to them. And as soon as we succeed in, in doing that and sharing that reality with them, the faster they're going to grow. So yeah, the pain thing is just, uh, you know, we've always got excuses for why we fail. Um, and one of the coolest things about working for university is, uh, are the resources that are available, available to us. And one of my favorite moments actually was in uh, 2012 and every five years or so, the athletic department brings in our brilliant, you know, local sociologist or psychologist or sports psychologist. And they lecture to us on the generation of athletes that we're recruiting and, and coaching. And these guys have been great. They've taught me so much over the years. And I can remember the lecture, the guy that spoke to us in 2012 gave us. And honestly, I can't remember everything he told us, but holy cow, do I remember his first two slides. His first slide I'll never forget because the date on it was 1969. I'll never forget that date because that was the year I graduated from high school. So here he's got this first slide up there on his PowerPoint and it's got 1969 at the top. And now I'm all in, man. This is my high school you know, uh, graduation year. And the, the slide pops up and all of a sudden the kid is coming home from school. He has all Fs on his report card and the parents are screaming at the kid. Now all of a sudden it changes to 2012 when the guy gave the lecture. Now the kid comes home from school with all Fs on his report card and the parents are screaming at the teacher. And of course, we are the teacher in that slide. The coach, we're the teacher. So if the kid's not starting and playing maximum minutes, is it the kid's fault? No, it's our fault. So who is the parent screaming at? It's us. Because God forbid, you know, their little wonderful darling, you know, couldn't be responsible for the fact they weren't as good as the rest of the recruiting class that is happened to be playing. No, 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 no. This is clearly my fault. I didn't believe in them. I didn't coach them. I didn't do something. But it's my failure that uh, they're, uh, you know, sweet little creature that's never experienced pain and in his or her life has ever, you know, done anything to compromise playing time because they were clearly the best player in, you know, New England or wherever they came from. But all of a sudden now in my environment, it's my fault because their youth coach believed in them. I don't believe in them. So now they don't have any confidence and 
So, you know, uh, they take all responsibility out of the hands of their children and they blame the environment around them, which of course is incredibly destructive for the evolution of that young athlete. Uh, so, uh, um, yeah, things are, uh, things are challenging now for all of us that uh, are coaching and teaching. And uh, the first thing we've got to do is to change the narrative. Basically, no, 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 guess what? You would play, I saw you play. You've got all the talent in the world, but there are pieces missing and here they are. Correct these and you'll get on the field. And do you feel like, you know, you talk about whoever that was who did the presentation, talked about that and that story, the difference between 1969 and 2012. Do you feel like when you look back, when you started at UNC, at the, the girls you were coaching at now, and do you feel like there is a difference? And obviously, I'm sure you try to, you know, sift through the weeds in general when you're recruiting and find the ones that are going to take more responsibility. But, you know, it, you, you can't bet a, a thousand percent at that. No, and I, I'm actually uh, not very good at that. Uh, and uh, part of the problem is early recruiting. Uh, back in the old days, and I talk about this all the time, back in the old days in a typical uh, five-player class, four out of the five would impact for me. Now in a typical five-player recruiting class, three out of the five do. Um, and uh, a lot of that is because now kids are making commitments as you know freshmen and sophomores in high school. And uh, when you're looking at a freshman and a sophomore, uh, I made all kinds of mistakes in recruiting during this one stretch where – an elite player would come visit my campus. She would be a freshman or a sophomore. And then uh, I would certainly be interested in her, but I wasn't convinced yet. I needed to watch her a bit more. And of course, I wouldn't offer her a scholarship immediately. And one of the worst mistakes you can make for a young woman these days is when they arrive on your campus, they're, if they're an elite player, is to not offer them their full scholarship. Because then, of course, they go over to visit Duke or Virginia, the comparable schools that we recruit against uh, in our conference, uh, the same sort of schools academically that a kid that you would be recruiting would look at. And all of a sudden Duke makes the offer and bang, you know, four or five months later after you've seen him play it three or four more times, yeah, you're now rolling out your full scholarship. Oh, no, no, no. You know, uh, when I visited, uh, you didn't offer, but Duke offered, so now they're off to Duke. So now you're thinking, oh my gosh or Virginia. So anyway, now you can't make this mistake. So now when a kid visits, you're thinking, oh my gosh, I saw them playing. Yeah, holy cow, did I like their game, but am I really going to extend a full to them right now? And then all of a sudden you're thinking, well, I have to, because of course, what's happening tomorrow, they're visiting Duke tomorrow, because you know, we're 10 miles apart. And so now you don't offer the full or you, and you think you have to. So now, gosh, you're sitting there thinking, Gosh, the last time I made this mistake, I had four years of hell playing against that kid that's playing at, you know, Duke or Virginia. I am not making that mistake this time. And the bang, you offer them a full. And then, holy cow, you're thinking, what have I done? And now these walk-ons you've recruited are, you know, getting more playing time than this kid you made a commitment to as a freshman or a sophomore. And it's not like they were horrible players. I mean, they had a certain level of athleticism and uh, but, you know, your walk-ons are beating them out from playing time. In fact, one of my favorite stories, speaking of 2012, <clears throat> uh, that 2012 team, we had four walk-ons starting, walk-ons starting, and we won the national championship, which meant my bench was littered with scholarship money. And so, you know, trust me, I've made so many of these mistakes, you know, and I've got a drawer filled with them. And if I could figure out a way, you know, to make these better choices, um, you know, sh explain to me the way, uh, because <clears throat> I make these mistakes constantly. Um, and by the way, I'm very proud of the walk-ons that end up making it. Um, but, you know, I've got, you know, so much scholarship money all over my bench. Um, and the tragedy about coaching at North Carolina is these kids never leave. I mean, they won't transfer. Because uh, if they would transfer, I could spend the money. But they love it here. And I understand why. I went to school here. I loved it here, too. Um, so I would never leave this place either. So, you know, I pay for my scholarship mistakes because they stay forever. And so how have you tried to adapt to that changing environment with recruiting where you are having to handle the pressure to make offers earlier? You don't have as much of an understanding of who the – the player is, and then there's a higher variance of outcome as a result. Well, 
there are all sorts of things we use, but honestly, we haven't figured it out entirely yet. I would love to pretend we have some sort of uh, secret algorithm that allows us to make great choices, but we don't. I mean, we still make the same kinds of mistakes. You're watching a kid play and you're thinking, oh my gosh, this kid has all those pieces. And they remind you of this other great player that you recruited uh, and that have played for you in the past that has gone on to great things. And, and you bring the kid in and then they're missing some of these pieces. And we have our own algorithms, but we don't really discuss these with them until they get here. Uh, we talk about self-discipline, competitive fire, self-belief, love of the ball, love of playing the game, love of watching the game, grit, coachability, and connection. Um, and if I could figure out a way before they got here to review all nine of those elements with them and parse the level that they have in all of them, uh, then I wouldn't make poor choices. But honestly, uh, you don't see... Uh, you don't see connection as much, uh, you know, when you're watching them play and you're scouting them. You don't see, uh, uh, you know, grit as much uh, because, yeah, you'd love to see grit. You'd love to see what happens when, you know, someone just kicks the crap out of them and they're losing in the game. Uh, uh, are they going to have impulse control? Are they going to figure out a way to come back in the game? Because oftentimes they're the player that causes their team to be so far ahead you don't get to see them suffer with adversity when you're, you know, watching them. And so it's really hard for you to see all these different things. And of course, at a youth level, you can't really see their competitive fire because they're so much better than everyone on the field, which is why you are considering offering them a full, that you don't see the, them having to compete. They can walk by anyone on the field. They can jump over everyone. They can, you know, dribble through them. You don't see this competitive fire that you've got to recruit when you're matched up with someone as good as you are or better. Uh, so I don't see all the pieces in the recruiting process and I only see it once they get here. And my assistant coach does this for me all the time and I appreciate him for it, which is why I haven't jumped off a bridge. But before we get a kid committing to us, I see all of their strengths. The day after their commitment, all I see are their weaknesses. And my assistant coach, a, a, a gentleman by the name of Chris Dukar stands next to me and we're watching this committed player on a full scholarship play. And I am muttering on the sideline, oh my gosh, you know, this kid doesn't defend worth a lick. You know, she won't head the ball. Are you kidding me? And we offered her a full and he's got his arm around me. He's saying, you know, Anson, don't worry. She's going to be okay. She's going to be okay. She's going to be okay. So he's preventing me from, you know, just, you know, throwing myself off the nearest bridge uh, just because, yeah, uh, in the recruiting process, all I see are strengths right after the commitment. I can list every single weakness after watching her play for like seven minutes. So, yeah, it's just it drives me crazy. You've talked a, a lot about being competitive yourself, both your team, uh, looking for it and players you recruit. How do you why is that such a big focus for you? And then how do you try to cultivate that within your program? Well, I think the ring that rules them all is competitive fire. Uh, I think uh, you've got to recruit players. If you want to win championships, you've got to re recruit players that uh, basically can deal with adversity, that can deal with uh, someone that's as good as they are or better, uh, because that's the collision once you get to uh, a high level is uh, what will separate you. And if nothing separates you, all you're left with is, is yourself. You're left with whatever is inside you that will to win, that will to take a physical risk, that, that will to sprint when your lungs are absolutely burning. Uh, that's the ring that rules everything. It rules even your self-discipline, that you don't have the fitness to come in at an elite level possibly, but holy cow, you can drive yourself so you're, you know, you're bleeding from your eyeballs, from your effort. Um, so that's, that's the piece uh, I would love to parse most particularly in sorting out someone's athletic character. Uh, but all the other pieces contribute in a very real way. And I've had some great athletes that were missing one of those nine pieces that didn't make it. And so for me, uh, that's what we talk about in the player conferences uh, about uh, how close they are to where they wanna be in those nine areas. Because every one of those nine is a choice. It's not a genetic quality you inherited at birth. So you talk about competitiveness with them I've heard you talk about the competitive cauldron before. Do, do you know who Shaka Smart is? Yeah. 
So I don't, I don't know if he's communicated this to, to you before, if you know each other, but I was listening to him speak recently and he was, you know, obviously a very well-respected, successful young coach. And he talked about your competitive cauldron and how he's stole that from you. Um, so can you explain what that is? And then what does it mean to you that, you know, you've got a, I would guess Shaka's under 40 years old, very successful, final four, well-respected. And most of all, he's a basketball coach and he's stealing your ideas to apply to his team. Angela Kelly, one of my favorite former players, is the women's soccer coach at UT. And apparently uh, Angie and uh, Shaka got together one day and I guess she was talking about what she did at UNC. And so when I was down there playing her team in soccer, uh, Shaka and I met together. And I explained to him the elements of the cauldron. And uh, just to show you how all this stuff goes full circle, I learned uh, uh, the principles behind the competitive cauldron from Dean Smith. Uh, Dean Smith was just this extraordinary man that embraced me when I was young and just basically dumb as a brick. And he brought me into his practice environments and he just, he was just one of these wonderful human beings and he treated everyone, even his lowliest manager, uh, with incredible compassion and respect. <laughs> and so uh, he even reached out to me, his women's soccer coach. And I, and I can remember uh, one day uh, I was saying, you know, hey, coach, do you mind if I, you know, come watch you uh, uh, train your basketball team? And he said, Anson, sure, you can come anytime you like. Just, you know, give uh, my staff some forewarnings so uh, we can tell you where uh, we're going to have you sit during the practice. Uh, and then we'll make sure that you have a practice plan right in front of you and, and just bring your whole staff, you know, and whenever you like, just let me know when you'd like to come. I said, well, coach, tell me the practice sessions where you think I would get the most out of it. And he says, well, uh, you know, I would say this coming week, maybe come on uh, a Tuesday. That might be interesting for you. So sure enough, I show up on Tuesday with my entire staff. And we're all sitting there and we're in this designated area in the Smith Center where we're watching practice. And all of a sudden this manager comes up to us before practice begins. And he hands each one of us a practice sheet. And on it to the minute is what they're doing <laughs> in every minute of practice. And first of all, right out of the gate, I was shocked uh, because uh, for years uh, I coached two teams at the same time. So I didn't really have a practice plan. I had sort of a general idea of what I was going to do in practice. Was this going to be a light day, a heavy day, or a fitness day, or a this day, or a that day? So I had sort of this general idea of what was going to happen. And I would always coach my men first, and then I would coach my women. And uh, my assistant coach uh, with the women, a wonderful man by the name of Bill Palladino, he and I, during the warm-up for the women's team, would plan the women's practice. <clears throat> and so, you know... <clears throat> So here I am with Bill Palladino and the rest of my staff, and we're handed this piece of paper. So we're shocked already. And then it's down to the minute. Are you kidding me? Down to the minute? Because I am inventing, you know, stuff during my practice, how long this is going to go. And I'm sort of watching stuff, you know. Yeah, they're getting bored with this. Let's move on to, you know, the next thing or whatever. <clears throat> so now down to the minute. And all of a sudden, not only is it down to the minute, but he's following down to the minute. So he's got, you know, his head manager at the scores table, you know, operating, you know, the shot clock, which tells him when this part of practice is over or whatever. Um, so anyway, <clears throat> to make a long story short, I'm watching this and I am stunned. There are assistant managers underneath every basket. Every time a guy hit, hit or missed a shot, it was recorded. They're playing a 3v3, 4v4, 5v5, or maybe even a 2v2 with the bigs underneath the basket. Every time a guy failed to box out for the rebound or boxed out, that was recorded. If they won or lost the 4v4, 5v5, or 2v2 thing, that was recorded. And I'm just in awe, and I'm watching this. And then all of a sudden, at the end of practice, all the guys flock to Dean Smith. All the assistant managers sprint to the scores table. <clears throat> and I'm going to talk about walk to the scores table. They sprint to the scorer's table. There the head manager is taking all these sheets of paper and you see him compiling that day's practice data. And I can see him furiously working. And then all of a sudden, uh, by the time Dean is finished addressing the troops, he turns around, his head manager hands him that day's practice data. They're ranked. The top five guys in practice leave the shower immediately. The next five guys are lined up to do suicides. And the last five guys, 
are doing suicides until the end of recorded time. And I'm just sitting there just, my jaw has dropped for the organizational ability of this man, but also the accountability in practice. Everything counts in practice. Everything counts in practice. I was thinking to myself, gosh, that's the way I would like to be evaluated as an athlete. I want to win in everything. Uh, I want to win in everything. I don't want to w lose in any aspect of any practice I've ever been involved in in any sport in my life. And I was thinking, oh, my gosh, do I love this? Because my philosophy as a young coach is I wanted to design a practice I would like to play in. So, yeah, I want to have some fun, but I want to kick everyone's rear end in, and I want everyone to know it. I want to be acknowledged for the fact that I just destroyed you in this part of practice, and then later I destroyed you in this part of practice, and all of a sudden, Dean is handing this to me. So what did we do? We took <clears throat> these ideas I stole from his training environment, I soccerized it, and I took it to a completely different level. So during practice, my managers are recording everything. By the next day on a bulletin board right next to my practice field, 28 different categories are up there. If we have a 30 player roster, you can look and see in 28 different categories where you rank from one to 30. Now, obviously we don't do all 28 different competitive things every single day in practice, but up there in the bulletin board is your ranking on where you stand in 28 different soccer categories. And this is, I have two, I think, extraordinary pillars in my program. The first one I stole from Dean Smith, the competitive cauldron. The second one <clears throat> was a character development matrix uh, that I stole from a New York Times magazine article. Uh, but for me, this gift that Dean Smith gave me, I share with everyone. One of my favorite moments, you speak about basketball, one of my favorite moments was actually at the White House. And this, I think it was in the summer of, uh, maybe 2004, and you can do your research, uh, but I think this is the right summer. And one of the President Bushes was entertaining all the Division I national champions. So they had, I think, almost every Division I sport there. Uh, but they also had the Division I football national champion. And we were all lined up, dressed to the nines, trying to get through security at the White House. This white-haired guy is fighting his way up the line. And I'm looking around, and I can see him moving up the line. It's really difficult to move through this line. And all of a sudden, he gets right in front of me, and he extends his hand to me, and he says, uh, Anson, you know who I am? I said, I'm sorry, sir, I don't. He says, my name is Pete Carroll. I'm the football coach at the University of Southern California, and we use your book to train our football team with. I'm thinking to myself, are you freaking kidding me? So here's this football coach, and I didn't know him from Adam, and it's not that I, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I just, I only follow <laughs> men's basketball at UNC and international women's soccer. So I certainly did not mean to insult him. <clears throat> and I've gotten to know him since. I have huge admiration for him. First of all, for him coming up and telling me. And then when we're all getting our pictures taken together, his assistant coaches were also coming up to me saying, Hey, coach, I just want you to know that we use your stuff in practice. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, this is unbelievable. And then out of the blue, you know, years later, he's playing the uh, Carolina Panthers uh, in Charlotte. And he calls me up and he says, Anson, uh, I just want you to know I have so much admiration for everything I've learned from you. I want you to be on my sideline. We're playing the Panthers this, uh, you know, I guess it's Sunday, right, for pro football. Mm -hmm. Sunday. And we want you to come down and, you know, I want you to be there on my sideline with me. And I just you know, want to just pay you this tribute. And I said, you know, coach, I'd love to come, but we're playing uh, the University of Miami. I can't get away. <laughs> but well, here's what I would love to do. I would love to come out to Seattle because by this time he was no longer coaching USC. He was now coaching the uh, Seattle team. And I said, I would love to spend a week with you. Um, is that, are you game? And he said, oh, Anson. You know, my team's struggling a bit this year. I don't think we're going to even make the playoffs. But, yeah, listen, if we're in the playoffs, yeah, please be my guest. Please come on out. You can watch practice and everything. To make a long story short, he turns the boat around. All of a sudden, he is in the playoffs. His team is doing great. And who is he playing that week? We go out to watch him play. He's preparing to play the Panthers. And all of a sudden, I'm there, and I just can't believe the way I'm treated by this extraordinary man. First of all, he's in this – 
uh, theater seating, enormous auditorium where every single player on his roster is in there. All of his coaches are in there. And I, did, I didn't understand anything about Seattle traffic. So I'm there like 10 minutes late for this first meeting. I'm thinking to myself, well, if this had been Dean Smith, I would have been shot because <laughs> De with Dean Smith's environment, you can't show up late. And I'm thinking, this is absolutely horrible. I can't believe I showed up late, but I just couldn't believe the traffic in Seattle. So anyway, get, I walk into this room and I walk in the back late and all of a sudden he sees me walk in and all of a sudden he says, gentlemen, I want you to know we're in the presence of greatness. And all of a sudden everyone's head is turning around. I'm thinking, holy crap. And now I understand why everyone loves this man. He just makes you feel on top of the world. And he certainly made me feel on top of the world. And then all of a sudden I go to his football practice and all of a sudden, uh, in the red zone, it's the O-line against the D-line. It's the running backs against the linebackers. It's the receivers against the D-backs. It's the number one quarterback against the number two quarterback. Everything is being report recorded. This is what he calls competitive Wednesdays. And he has designed this particular day after the cauldron. And there are all these battles. And you can see the, you know, the, uh, uh, the cornerbacks and the uh, wide receivers actually getting into minor fights as one is claiming the other one is cheating because of course one of them has ended up winning this particular duel and you can see all these just these really aggressive battles going on out there and that's exactly what happens in my cauldron in my cauldron um they fight hard to win and if there's any sort of issue i am the supreme court they, they bring the case before me and i usually end up dismissing it because I got out of exactly what I wanted. And I had this one player, uh, this wonderfully competitive kid that didn't have all the tools, wasn't particularly athletic, but boy, did she know how to win. And whenever anything was controversial, she would come up to me and complain about the fact that, you know, so-and-so cheated. And I said, well, make your case. She would make her case. I say, dismissed, you know, summary judgment, no. So, and she would get mad as hell at me because everything she thought she was telling me was her right to win this particular case in the cauldron. And I said, listen, uh, Darcy, I got exactly what I wanted out of you. You fought like hell on that exercise. I don't care who won and lost that. And the fact you lost that, I kind of like it because I know what's going to happen tomorrow. Holy cow, is everyone going to suffer from you tomorrow? And that's exactly what I want in practice. Is someone like you making sure everyone is suffering to win. And this used to drive her crazy because she thought the integrity of winning and losing in the cauldron <clears throat> was important to me. It wasn't. The thing that's important to me in the cauldron is that you fight like hell to win every single thing. Because what am I doing? I'm replicating the match that you have to win to win championships and to win gold medals in the Olympics and world championships, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think now, finally, I think Darcy understands, and she's been out of school for a while, you know, what I was after. What I was after with the cauldron isn't the result. I was after the effort. I was after Carol Dweck. That's what the cauldron produces for me. And, and it's funny you talk about that story with Pete Carroll, because I know he's talked about uh, after he was let go at some point, I think with the Jets maybe, about focusing on competitiveness. And as you're talking about this uh, in the first however long we've been talking, it, that bleeds out of you. And I was thinking uh, about you two being very, very similar in that regard. Well, let me tell you this. Uh, um, Terry Laskevich and uh, Pete Carroll are friends. Terry Laskevich is the former women's national team and Olympic coach in volleyball for the United States. His daughter was a soccer player. And he got a hold of my book one day and really liked it. Uh, the book he got was Training Soccer Champions. And uh, he shared it with Pete Carroll way back in the days uh, when Pete, I think, was still coaching at USC. And I don't know his entire progression. You might know it better than I did, but I think he first went to New England. Is that true? I think so too, but you're right. Okay, good. That. I think it was New England because all of a sudden, uh, Terry uh, is doing a volleyball clinic in Chapel Hill with my college volleyball coach. Uh, and uh, Terry wanted me to lecture in uh, one part of his two or three day long volleyball clinic for all these coaches across North Carolina. And he brought me the New England Patriots preseason, um, I guess, practice plan. Uh -huh. 
and I'm not, I'm not going to get this exactly right, but I think I get this pretty close to the truth. Of the first 18 pl uh, pages in this manual, the first 12 were litted, lifted verbatim out of my book without even changing a word. Um, and Terry showed that to me, that this coach that I didn't know anything about in New England was using uh, training soccer champions as uh, basically a practice plan for how he was going to coach New England. So this is something that obviously resonated also with Pete. Um, so he was doing this, I think, as he made his various progressions before he ended up uh, uh, in Seattle. If you enjoy this podcast, I also write a weekly newsletter sharing the best content I found in the last week that directly applies to coaches. Some of the best coaches in the world subscribe, and it's free. So go to coachingcoaches.substack.com or check out the link in the show notes to subscribe. Once again, that's coachingcoaches.substack.com. Let's get back to the episode. So, so many coaches try to focus on learning over time who are successful. And we've talked about you trying to learn from Coach Smith, Shaka Smart trying to learn from you, Pete Carroll trying to learn from you, and, and vice versa. Like, do you think that having a thirst for knowledge and trying to always learn and grow yourself as a coach is a requirement to, to succeed as a high-level coach? It's the absolute bottom line. If you're not uh, growing every year, you're falling behind. The game is changing. You've got to learn the latest stuff from the game. There are brilliant people out there that can teach you all kinds of things. If you don't have an extraordinary curiosity about the world and the people that are in it, you're not going to get to your potential and you're not going to drive the people around you to their potential as well, which gets to the, the other thing that I think separates what we do. My wife will tell you that uh, I've got all these strange habits. One of my strangest is I get the New York Times every Sunday. I devour the Sunday paper and the five pieces of the paper uh, I read in detail are the review, uh, which is basically a sort of a, a cerebral attack on uh, the political uh, temperature of the nation, but it can be anything. Yeah. Um, uh, the New York times magazine. Uh, I certainly read uh, uh, the review of books, uh, which is fabulous. I read the business section. Um, and so I, I read basically five different sections. I, I read almost every word in those sections. And by the way, if I haven't read it, I don't throw it away. It sits piled up in a corner and my wife hates it. It's a fire hazard. I mean, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I love it. Years ago, uh, I'm reading the New York Times Magazine and this woman that was a graduate student in Columbia in Russian literature <clears throat> is speaking about this professor they hired just before she got there by the name of Joseph Brodsky. Brodsky comes in, she, he's a Russian exile poet, and he comes in and asks all of his PhDs in Russian literature and Russian poetry to memorize reams of Russian literature and Russian poetry. All the uh, graduate students there with her, other PhD candidates, and I assume master's candidates, just couldn't believe what Brodsky was asking them to do. So they get together as a cabal and sort of object to this saying, he doesn't know where he is. He's at Columbia, we're one of the world's elite universities. He's treating us like elementary school children. And this is ridiculous. Let's go and tell him he doesn't know where he is. This is not for us. You know, we want his uh, lectures. We want to understand, you know, what's going on. This is just ridiculous. Let's tell him we're not going to do this. So they all go into his office and, and basically object. And he says, well, if none of you guys memorize any of this, none of you guys get your PhDs and masters. And so, of course, they get to work. She's writing this article years later, and she says, because of this demand to memorize everything, it completely changed her cerebral fabric. It changed her capacity to discuss Russian literature. She said for the first time in her life, she felt what it was like to be in Russia. And she said it transformed her. And I'm thinking, you know what? I'm one of these guys that reads everything under the sun and I love to read business books. And so I was reading all these business books that were telling me how to create an extraordinary culture. And uh, the core of all these business books was about, you know, having a set of core values that you lived by within the culture. So I had all these, you know, wonderfully insipid core values about working hard, about all these different things and nothing was really working. And so uh, I'm, I'm thinking, you know what? I'm going to steal this idea from Brodsky. So with everything that I thought was important for our culture, 
I would find a motivational quote that would motivate me to live this core value. So one of my critical core values for the freshman, um, and it bounces directly off what you and I were talking uh, earlier, uh, which is about, uh, you know, uh, basically being a, your own master, basically not whining about everything, you know, not having a narrative that protected you from pain or the truth, but, you know, if you fail to embrace it and then not complain about it and, you know, basically get it done. So the first core value we had was, you know, we don't whine. So that's a core value within our program. So what did we attach to that? We attached to be a force of fortune rather than a feverish, selfish little clot of ailments and grievances complaining that the world will not devote itself to making you happy. That's a George Bernard Shaw quote. And it captures, in my opinion, whining. I hate whining. I hate people who whine. I, I just absolutely hate it. It revolts me and I want to eliminate that. So that's the first uh, core value uh, quote that everyone memorizes. We have 13 of these. The girls memorize all of them and they have to live them. And they're also evaluated against them by everyone in the program. So they get uh, peer evaluations twice a year from everyone in the program <clears throat> on how they're living our core values. There's a line of demarcation. And if they fall below this line, if their average core value is below this line, we try to get them to transfer or quit because they clearly don't embrace our core values. It's the most powerful thing I've done next to the competitive cauldron. And, and I got it from the New York Times Magazine. And honestly, it does transform them. By the time they graduate, you can see their character growth. In my program, the primary mission is not winning national championships. Our primary mission is not soccer development. Our primary mission is human development. It's the development of character. The number one award at our annual athletic banquet is not MVP. It's the Kelly Muldoon Award for character. And it's the vote that they get in their peer evaluation in the, at the end of the fall and the end of the spring from all of their teammates. That is the top award at our banquet. And I value that. The second priority for me as a collegiate educator is their academic success. The final level for me is their soccer development. So our culture is built on human development. And the first two things that I value are character and academics. And so for me, that's the foundation for our culture. Do you think if you went back early in your career, if you and I were talking and I said, what's the primary role you have as the coach at UNC that you would say those same things? Or do you think you've evolved over the career where either because you've evolved as a person or because you've won and now are able to stick your foot down on those things? I would not have said any of that. If you had seen me in my early years, I was just hoping not to be exposed as a fraud. So no. Uh, and for me, uh, soccer games were like chess. Uh, the queen is worth nine. Your castles are worth, you know, fives. Your basically bishops and horses are worth threes. Your pawns are worth ones. I tried to figure out a way to organize uh, my queen in the best position for me to win where my pawns would go, where my castles and horses and bishops would go. For me, soccer <clears throat> was a chess game. It was trying to figure out a way to organize my training environment so if I could piece together the right ideas and the correct order in practice, we would improve. And then if I could organize my team well in the right way, uh, we could win games. And so no, my entire focus as a young coach was just the game. And the longer I was in it, uh, the more I learned from all of my mistakes and my development was just littered with one mistake after another. Uh, and uh, if I do have a good quality, it's, uh, it's a certain humility to know that that was my fault. That was my fault. That was my fault. I've got to change that. I've got to change that. I've got to change that. And I would try to correct every mistake I made. Uh, I also am a voracious reader. I would read everything under the sun. Uh, and I think that benefited me tremendously as well. And so, no, I would not pretend for a second that any of the stuff uh, I was doing now, uh, I would have earlier except for one piece.
I am extraordinarily competitive. Everyone says that, but they're not. They don't know what it is. Um, my favorite story is actually uh, when I arrived at UNC, uh, uh, I transferred into UNC as a second semester freshman. When I arrived, I moved into Teague dorm. I transferred from St. Mary's University in San Antonio, Texas. When I arrived at UNC, uh, uh, I arrived at Teague dorm and uh, the intramural manager at Teague came into my room uh, and said, uh, Anson, we take intramurals here at Teague very seriously. Uh, would you please look at this list of sports and tell me which sport uh, you think you're good enough in to represent the dorm in? So he hands me this list of, you know, 10 or 11 or 12 sports that we were going to compete in as a dorm, you know, for, in the winter and spring. And I looked at it for a second and I handed the clipboard back to him. I said, if you want to win, put me on every single team. He thought I was joking. He put me on every single team and we started an 11 year intramural dynasty at Teague dorm. I was beating the hell out of everyone on campus in every single sport. I love all sports. <clears throat> and because of my background, we moved around every three years. I would jump into the athletic culture of the place I lived in. So uh, it didn't matter what the culture was. I would jump in and play whatever sport they were playing. Uh, and I was very competitive. And so the quality I think that separates me as a coach is competitive fire. I coach competition. I think extraordinarily well. And I think that's uh, my gift in coaching. I think there are a lot of people out there that know more about the game than I do, even though I study it constantly. I think there are a lot of people out there that are more empathetic, uh, uh, like some extraordinary coaches are, uh, and warm, uh, like so many brilliant coaches are uh, than I am. Uh, but I think the quality uh, that I have that separates me is competitive fire. I understand it. I can smell it when I, when I see it. I can smell it when I don't see it, which makes it very easy for me to coach it. Because if you don't have it, I'm gonna know immediately and we're gonna to try to change that as fast as possible. Because all these things are choices and I'm gonna make sure the ring that rules them all, competitive fire, becomes a part of who you are as fast as possible so I can get you on the field. So I have so many follow-up questions on that. So first, it, it makes me think of the story of Uber's founder, Travis Kalanick, um, and, and Uber, for those who don't know the story, was, has had a lot of issues over the years as a result of how their culture was because it was a win at all costs, no matter what. And their CEO, that was him. He was win at all costs, very competitive like you are. Not at all costs to break the rules, but very competitive. And he, I've heard the story that he was at some point like the number one Wii tennis player in the world because he started playing it and he couldn't stop playing it until he was like the absolute best at it. So it's just you talking about that makes me think of that, that you just want to win at absolutely every aspect of life. Um, so when it, when in your career did you then go from focusing on just being competitive to then all these other things? And why did you make that change? I think you have to evolve. I think you have to constantly change and evolve if you want to become your best self. I think if you're not learning something, you're regressing. And I know these are cliches. They're, they are cliches, but they're true. Um, so you've got to continue to evolve. I don't believe in winning at all costs. If one of my players grabs a jersey, I will get really upset with her because that's cheating. I don't think you should cheat to win. And even though in soccer, it's incredible how often you see jersey pulling at all levels and it's never addressed. <clears throat> I think it's a form of cheating. I absolutely hate it. I think one of the ways the soccer uh, rules should change is we should give referees more opportunities to enforce the rules. And the trouble with the tools our referees are given is they're not given enough tools to make the game perfect. And I think you can make the game perfect. I think we should introduce sin bins. Uh, the trouble with the yellow card system is it's too all or nothing. And too many players are ejected for a second yellow. They don't deserve to be ejected. The rules in soccer 
If you have a red card, you have to sit the next game. That's ridiculous. Why penalize your team against your next opponent when the team that should have benefited from this is the team you are playing against first? And so I think the sin bin would be wonderful. I think any sort of breach in the rules, the referee should have an opportunity to say, hey, you, you're off. Because if there's one thing that's going to change player behavior, it's not playing. All of us love to play. If you throw us out of the game, even if it's for 15 minutes, we're going to really suffer. So I think all these little ways that we're cheating in soccer should be addressed with the sin bin. You're off. I just saw you grab the jersey. VAR saw you grab the jersey. I saw you wrap your arm around him. You're off. And let's eliminate that. It's going to make the game much more exciting because the defender is going to lose the tool to cheat with that's going to allow us to score more goals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I hate cheating. I don't want to win at all costs because, again, my priority is still this character issue. Um, so no. Uh, so I would love to create additional rules to prevent it. In fact, what was interesting this year, since we didn't have any crowds because of uh, the COVID, um, one of my girls, I watched what happened. I didn't see my girl pulling this other girl's jersey. And I saw this girl basically take my kid out. And I was so angry that the foul was called on my kid. I got up and started railing against the referee. And the referee came over and said, Anson, your kid grabbed her jersey. And I was thinking, well, that is entirely possible because I couldn't see where her arms were. And so then immediately after the referee came over and told me why he had made that call, when it was clear to me my kid was fouled, is I screamed at my kid and unfortunately the mic picked it up and I swore a little. And I was basically telling her, hey, leave that girl alone. In other words, don't you frigging grab her jersey. And it was caught on the mic. So in the, you know, a lot of our games are televised. I could hear myself screaming at her on the mic with the swear word, you know, because, you know, I don't believe in jersey pulling. Uh, so anyway, so no, I don't believe in winning at all costs, but I do believe in everything you can do to basically uh, win in everything you're doing without cheating. So one more question for you before I get to the end of episode question. So you have obviously had incredible success. You've won over 20 national titles. You can afford not financially, but I guess political capitally to not do well for a bunch of years and still be able to stay, have your job and keep coaching in the program. Not that you haven't, I'm just doing a hypothetical there. You know, you've got other coaches out there. Let's say I just get hired at university of X and there's a lot of pressure on me to win both on myself. Cause I want to do well, but also the university wants me to win and I've got to balance. Okay. I want to win a championship with, I also want to develop my guys or gals. I want to have them grow as human beings in personal development. How do you balance those two pressures with job to perform on the field with to perform off the field with how they're growing as people while keeping your job? Well, first of all, they're all interrelated. Uh, please don't think for a second that when we're working on character development, that's not contributing to our success in the field. Of course it is. Uh, please don't think that um, when we're working on that, that that doesn't help us in recruiting. Of course it does. All these things bleed out of your program in the most positive way. Uh, whenever a kid talks about us, they do talk about the fact that, you know what? Well, here, I'll give you one of my favorite compliments I got from a kid that's uh, uh, playing in the pro leagues right now. And uh, she was playing for a coach that uh, she wasn't really getting along with. Uh, and uh, she paid me this backhanded compliment. She says, you know, Anson, uh, when I played for you, when I left, I thought I could play for anyone. In other words, implying that, gosh, it was so hard surviving your practices. I didn't think there was a training environment in the world wh where I would go to, where I would struggle in any way. And so I understood that <laughs> statement she was making. She says, you know what? But the thing I now understand about you is that when you criticized us, we felt the love through your criticism. And I think that's a very, very important thing for all of us in coaching to understand. Um, I'm a member of a very conservative church. I'm a Mormon, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And we're all teachers in our church. Every one of us has uh, some kind of calling that involves teaching. And so on a regular basis, uh, we are uh, taught how to be teachers. Uh, one of my favorite instructors is a friend of mine by the name of Peter Peets. 
and he was my instructor before I was going to be teaching a gospel doctrine class. And it was really interesting, uh, the church's manuals for uh, uh, all the different uh, principles that we have to live by are absolutely wonderful. The first principle in teaching in the Mormon church is love those you teach. And I'll be honest with you, at first when I started coaching, uh, that wouldn't have been me at all. And please don't think my influences were just from the game itself or just from reading books. No, they're from uh, all the different resources that are available to all of us. And that's such an incredibly important principle to understand. And how did I survive for so long? Uh, I survived because I also had extraordinary people around me. For years, my assistant was a gentleman by the name of Bill Palladino, who's extraordinarily warm. I am a shark with blood in the water. And this was a big, warm, loving teddy bear. And he and I were a wonderful complement together. And it's really interesting. When I uh, uh, did some studying with Gallup leadership, uh, they, uh, they kept telling me what's most critical when you're developing uh, your leadership platform and the people you're working with, make sure there's balance. Try to hire people that are strong where you are weak. I've always been very good at doing that. And Dino and I were a wonderful combination. Dino has since stepped back, but now I've brought in uh, Damon Nahas and Heather O'Reilly, two more coaches that are just so uh, hilarious and loving, and they're naturally warm. Uh, and so these are all critical. So uh, these are people that balance off uh, uh, my fire, because you need that balance in the coaching profession. You can't have these people that are all the same. So please understand that's also a part of this algorithm as you're trying to take yourself to your potential. But the most critical thing is to love those you coach, because if you genuinely love them, you're never going to make a mistake uh, that destroys them uh, in any way. So coach, some end of episode questions for you. What's, and so I'm going to change up the first couple of these. I'm going to adjust them for you. So I typically ask one's what's one book every coach should read, but I'm going to ask two questions. What's the first of your books people should read if they decide they want to start one? And then what's an off the wall book that's not one you typically hear people recommend that you'd recommend for people? I've got three books out there. One of them I didn't write. Uh, and if you want to know about our culture, the best one to read is the one I did not write. And that book is The Man Watching by Tim Carruthers. Uh, there's a chapter in there uh, where all of my critics have voice. So this is not a hagiography. Uh, this has me warts and all. And yet I still recommend that book first because I don't want to pretend for a second uh, that I've done everything perfectly. I have not. Uh, but one thing I have done consistently, I have learned from my mistakes. So that would be the first book to read. Uh, the other books would be Training Soccer Champions, which is the book that uh, uh, Pete Carroll uh, wrote, which is a book I wrote for coaches. A book I wrote for player is The Vision of a Champion. And actually, I've started my own podcast. And we have 20 episodes, excuse me, in this podcast that's attached to each of the 20 chapters in the book. And the podcast attached to each of these chapters in the vision of a champion are people like Crystal Dunn and Tobin Heath, uh, two players that are currently starting on the US full national team. Uh, Lucy Bronze, who plays for the English full national team. Uh, people like uh, Roy Williams, of course, our current basketball coach. Uh, and other uh, incredible celebrities across the spectrum uh, of, uh, all games, but also uh, our sport, uh, which will address all the chapters in that book. But the man watching is a really good study because Tim Carruthers came down. He was a Sports Illustrated senior writer. He was getting jaded from covering the NBA for, for SI. And he went to UNC. So he had you know, read about some of our success. So he came down to spend a year with me and just study what we were doing and, and writing a book. He ended up spending five years. He enjoyed it so much. And he wrote a book originally that was over a thousand pages and he figured out a way to edit it down to 400. Cause I think the publisher was telling her, you're never going to sell a thousand page book <clears throat> on a women's soccer coach. So let's narrow this baby down. So I think it's, you know, maybe a little over 400. He interviewed as many players as he could, former players, current players. I gave him full access to everything. Uh, I felt confident that if he had full access uh, that we would pretty much come out on top and it will be a book that would recruit for us. And you know what it is. And even though there is a chapter on all of my critics that voice all of their opinions, 
Um, it still uh, comes out uh, uh, where people, after they read it, would say, you know what, um, I would still like to go there if a player read it or if a parent read it. Yeah, I would still love to send my daughter there. So that would be the first one to read. Uh, so The Man Watching by Tim Carruthers. The book I would recommend you read, uh, this is the most impactful book of my life, is uh, Victor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. Um, and the most critical element in that book is uh, the last of the human freedoms. The last of the human freedoms is to choose your attitude in any given set of circumstances to choose your own way. And uh, this is a guy making that statement in a concentration camp where everyone he loved was murdered. And yet he woke up every morning uh, with the last of the human freedoms to choose his attitude. If he could choose to have a positive attitude in that situation. In my gilded life and in your gilded life, Colby, and everyone else's gilded life who lives in this extraordinary country with all the freedoms that we have, certainly has the opportunity to choose that as well. So that book uh, is the most impactful book uh, uh, for me. The other thing I would also recommend people read uh, are David Foster Wallace's This Is Water. It's the most extraordinary commencement address I've ever heard in my life. And the reason I attach that with Viktor Frankl is it speaks to a broader audience. You've got to have some cerebral bent to read uh, Viktor Frankl. You don't have to have any sort of cerebral or intellectual bent to read David Foster Wallace's This Is Water. It is the most brilliant collection of principles that are taught and the most common language with the most common experiences that I think can teach us all how to behave. Because it basically teaches us about how all of us should select to live a compassionate life. Um, and I think uh, those two things together, and they're both very short reads, by the way, I think could impact on all of us in a most positive way. All great recommendations, and I'll link them all uh, in the show notes for those listening. Um, so. Who's, I typically ask, what's one person, who's one person you'd want to hear as a guest on the podcast, but I'm going to change that for you too. So you've, you've been able to, throughout your career and life, you've talked about meeting presidents and Pete Carroll and Dean Smith. Who's one person you wish you could go spend a day with who you haven't to this point? His name is Bielsa. He coaches Leeds United. I am now a fan of Leeds. In fact, you couldn't have picked a more perfect time to interview me. <laughs> because I have been an Arsenal fan and I have finally given up. And this is very hard for me to do. It's almost impossible for me to mention publicly. I am switching my allegiance from Arsenal to Leeds United because of Bielsa. And let me share something about Pete Carroll. Um, I only root for two football teams. I wrote for the University of North Carolina and Mac Brown has us humming. And I love having Mac Brown back. Uh, I love him as a man. And obviously he's an extraordinary coach and holy cow, are we gonna change the culture of football here with Mac here? I love having him. But I will also always root for any team that Pete Carroll is coaching. So uh, those are my, my two football teams, Bielsa, is a coaching genius. Because here's what I love about Bielsa. He doesn't need all the expensive players. He took a team out of the championship, which is basically the English second division. He won the championship. He's now in the EPL, the top division in English football. And holy cow, do his kids play. And it's not like they're all these multimillionaires like the ones that are playing for the Arsenal or for Man United or Man City or Liverpool or you know Tottenham and all the rest of them. No, he's got a very ordinary roster with human beings that as Carol Dweck would say, succeed through effort. I love the human qualities that will allow us to be extraordinary. The qualities that every one of us possess, which is why in my player conferences, the nine things we talk about are choices you get to make not your talent, not the genetic, I guess, gift you are given because of your mother and father, choices you get to make to become extraordinary. When I watch Bielsa and Leeds United play, I see these guys that are killing themselves to be successful, that are playing an amazing game, uh, attractively for me, with 
a poverty stricken roster that are competing against these billionaires and, you know, Russian oligarchs and Arab sheiks with human beings that have the quality that I admire most, which is just will, the will to win, which is why my historical mentor is Winston Churchill in the most dire period in Western civilization's history. When basically an evil tyrant was trying to conquer the world, this one man stood in his way. And with the human elements that separate him from the rest of us, he basically had England survive and then obviously recruit the United States into crushing uh, the, one of the worst autocrats in uh, the history of the world. And I admire that. I admire the human qualities that Winston had, which is why I love watching Leeds United, but also watching Bielsa coach. Well, I'm glad we could break news of your new uh, <laughs> on the podcast. That'll be big, uh, trending on SportsCenter tomorrow. What's one area you're looking to improve in over the next year? I hired an absolutely brilliant assistant coach by the name of Damon Nahas and another brilliant former player of mine by the name of Heather O'Reilly. Uh, we've got, all got different ideas on how the game should be played. And we're in the process of trying to fuse all these ideas together. The trouble with a collegiate season is you're just tapering into every game. So the fall isn't the time to do it. But what's happened now is um, the national championship for women's soccer has now been extended into this spring. And even though all five of my seniors have left to sign pro contracts, I'll be probably the only elite team in division one without any of its seniors playing. We're going to try to do a Bielsa. Bielsa has figured out a way to compete against Liverpool with, you know, his, his kids that just try hard. Uh, so we're going to try to figure out a way, since we will only have one game a week now, to train our kids into a completely different level. And even though we're not going to have the talent of a lot of teams that are out there, we're going to try to uh, build our success just off of this Bielsa quality that he has somehow magically injected into his players. Um, and we're going to try this fusion between me, uh, Chris Dukar, my longtime goalkeeper coach, uh, Damon Nehas, this absolutely brilliant young coach, and uh, Heather O'Reilly, my uh, new volunteer assistant, former all-time great for the United States and former Tar Heel, and see if we can uh, create a new player development paradigm. What's, what advice do you have for young coaches listening to this? I think the most critical thing, uh, is to constantly uh, learn from everything you can. There's so much uh, information out there for us on the internet now. Uh, we can study the greats. We can study them in detail. Uh, so uh, please pick out a mentor. Uh, maybe pick out a mentor the way I've picked out my new football mentor by watching their teams play and say, you know what? I love the way they play. Uh, but make sure it's not the way they play just because they had the deepest pockets and they bought these incredible players and just threw them out there, uh, which is what I really enjoy about watching Bielsa. And I know his roster is not the most expensive, but boy, do I love watching him play. And he figures out a way to make this extraordinary roster competitive. I have to pick someone <clears throat> that's in an environment similar to mine. It's very hard for me to recruit a player that Stanford recruits. They end up getting them, you know, like, 90% of the time. It's very hard for me to recruit a Catholic that Notre Dame recruits. They get them 75% of the time. It's very hard for me to recruit a foreigner that uh, Mark Krikorian recruits at Florida State. He will get them, you know, 95% of the time. It's very hard for me to recruit a kid that Duke or Virginia recruits. Uh, they will get them such a large percentage of the time. So I've put myself in uh, Bielsa's shoes that I've got to figure out a way uh, with playing against a team uh, like Virginia, that has seven kids I offered major scholarship money to, I've got to figure out a way to try to beat that team. So I've got to figure out a way in my training environments to take my kids uh, to a level to compete with these other rosters that are more talented. Uh, so that's my unique challenge, which is why I have picked a mentor that's basically doing the same thing. So pick that mentor out, but pick that mentor out for the right reasons. It's great advice. Last question, Coach. What's the darkest moment you experienced professionally, and how did you overcome it? Well, basically, uh, uh, I had cut this player, and I don't cut many players. I think I've only cut like 
three players in my life. I cut this one player and her father uh, recruited uh, another player off my roster and I was sued for uh, uh, hostile environment. Uh, hostile environment is under the um, category of sexual harassment. So you can imagine uh, the way the press took off with that sort of uh, lascivious background. Uh, there was a big article in Sports Illustrated uh, about this. Um, and it was just a really, really a challenging time, a challenging time certainly for my family because uh, all these people would call the house. Um, and, you know, it was just, uh, there were all this stuff going on. And, you know, looking back now, uh, I'm glad it happened because holy cow, now am I bulletproof. Uh, there's nothing like having this sort of extraordinary crisis in, in your life to make you appreciate everyone around you. Because what was wonderful is my team stood behind me and then, of course, because uh, this was a, a, a lawsuit, uh, the attorney general of the state of North Carolina got into it. And in order to protect me, he emailed all of our former players to see if there was any credibility to this. And then all of a sudden, what this uh, North Carolina attorney general did uh, was he kept sending me these unbelievable statements from all of my former players. And so even though it was really hard at the time, um, and obviously I thought it would absolutely devastate me in recruiting. It was extraordinary how nothing uh, negative happened. Uh, basically, uh, no one believed them. Uh, the case uh, was eventually settled. Um, and uh, I read all these incredible emails from all of my former players that stood behind me. And uh, it was just one of those just amazing uh, uh, feelings. And then the other thing uh, is uh, um, my eldest daughter, but when I would get these crank calls, and of course she was a teenager at the time, uh, maybe 13 or 14, I can't remember. She would pick up the phone and she was so polite. I could tell it was a crank caller because all of a sudden her facial expression would change into a frown. And she would wait for the person to finish what they were saying and then she would just attack them. And then I would pull the phone away from her and basically just hang up. And holy cow, was it wonderful to watch one of your kids just attack these people on the phone. I mean, uh, there's nothing like family when you're attacked. And uh, this wonderful little kid who's now in her 40s, it was wonderful to see what happened to her life because this extraordinary young woman won a MacArthur Genius Award. She's one of the best uh, rhythm tap dancers in the world. She's got her own dance company. She's won so many awards, it's unbelievable. But you could see the seeds of this uh, young girl's toughness uh, just react to me being attacked. And uh, you know, from that day forward, I was thinking to myself, you know what, I'm not gonna worry about this kid. She is absolutely fine you know, listening to her come to my defense. Uh, and also it brought the family incredibly close. Uh, and so it, again, it gets back to what I was sharing earlier. There's nothing like adversity uh, to pull people together, uh, to get you to appreciate what you really have, uh, to get you to uh, basically uh, uh, develop a kind of toughness, uh, which I think is critical if you're gonna navigate uh, 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 this world, because life is difficult. Uh, so uh, that was the uh, most difficult moment of my life uh, uh, professionally, uh, because it involved uh, exposing my family uh, to this vitriol. And then, of course, uh, the press, you know, went to town. And so that was difficult as well. But the program uh, didn't stagger. The players all came in behind it. Uh, we continue to recruit well. We continue to win uh, national championships. Uh, and uh, it, just, it just showed how strong our culture was. Yeah, well, I appreciate you sharing. I cannot imagine, but I'm glad uh, some positives came out of it. So, Coach, thanks so much for uh, joining me today. I appreciate it. You've been listening to the Coaching Coaches Podcast. Be sure to subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast platform and receive our world-class newsletter in your inbox every Sunday. You can access both of those at coachingcoaches.co. Once again, that's coachingcoaches.co.